Okay, so hopefully everyone can hear us. Um, if if you can, maybe uh, give us a yes, and uh, um, we'll we'll get rolling on this. Um, I know Blair can, but hopefully the other guys on there can give us a thumbs up or a, or a chat message that you can hear us. So, um, yeah, so welcome to this this recap of our seed update. It's going to be a very similar presentation to what Blair Blair has, Blair Baylog on the call there. And, and myself gave at our seed update in December here in Enchant. Uh, we wanted to provide it for the people online who couldn't make it. And then do, we're doing a recording here for, um, um, so we can post it to YouTube afterwards and people can search it and find it. So um, basically um, what I wanted to start off with was uh, Blair's gonna start off with some forage trials, corn trials, uh, cover crops, things like that. And then we're going to switch into myself, uh, going to cover off just general seed varieties, uh, net return estimates, and uh, uh, just some ideas on what crops look attractive and, and just some options that way. So probably be about an hour and a half max is my thought. Um, but feel free to ask questions throughout. Uh, just unmute yourself and ask a question or type it in the chat, but we may not catch the chat questions quite fast. Uh, do alert me one way or the other if there is a, a question in the chat, Blair, yeah. and I'll alert you if I see one as well. And uh, yeah, we'll get rolling. So Blair uh, Blair's new to us from this past spring and uh, brings a wealth of knowledge uh, from the corn world and uh, has has picked up and ran with all the other crops as well and, and really doing a great job on, on all the other sales as well. So uh, feel free to contact him with any questions you may have regarding seed sales. So, but Blair, I think I'll turn it over to you and this is your screen already, so. Yeah, it is. You're, yeah, you're thank you, go. Greg. I will get right into it here. So, mm -hmm. so we'll be starting with what's new in corn varieties for uh, 2023. Uh, we have the pleasure of being Thunder Seed Dealers for Southern Alberta. Uh, they're a great, great company to work with. They have a abundance of products that suit many different areas. So excited to see what's ahead with them. I'll be starting with a high, di high digestibility silage. Can't get that out right now, but uh, it was developed by Thunder to give uh, livestock a uh, better ability to break down uh, forage more efficiently. Uh, kernels are soft it can be fractured uh, easier than other varieties. Uh, you'll see in the next slide, I have some pictures of uh, some manure of showing this. Um, the ears are lower in the plant, uh, which allows for more plant above the ear to be di digestible, um, which is great for if you wanna graze corn as well. Um, but it still ensures good structure below the ear so that you don't have uh, green snap and lodging issues. So, um, planting rates for these varieties, they can go as low as 27,000 seeds per acre and perform at a high level. So here's the two pictures kind of showing the comparison on the left there. It's uh, thunder 4076. As you can see, there's not really any, uh, kernels in there. And then on the right, that's just another variety um, that has a lot of kernels that weren't broken down. So these were silage trials that we, we were a part of this year in Southern Alberta. The top, top one was just outside Vauxhall and the bottom one was just outside Coaldale. So as you can see, Thunder uh, for silage performs very well. Um, middle of the pack kind of this past year, but has a lot of room and for improvement and I, exciting things ahead. This next slide, this is the corn or grain trials that we were a part of this year. The On the left side, that was a trial that was done south of Barnwell. And on the right side, that was a trial that was done at the same field in um, just outside of Vauxhall there. So, as you can see on the grain, grain side of things, Thunder performs very well, very consistent overall. Thanks. Now I'll get into new products that were launched for the 2023 growing season. 
Um, the 6370 uh, VT Double Pro, it is the earliest silent, or earliest hybrid in Thunder's catalog. It's 1925 core heat units. It's great for the early ultra early silage market. It has a fit for um, some areas in Southern Alberta, um, but that's where we could kind of figure it out together if it would work for you. And then below that is 4386 uh, HDRR. That's one of the high digestibility products. It's a 2600 heat, uh, core heat unit product. It has a nice fit for Southern Alberta. It's a very nice tall plant. And I'm excited to see the potential that comes from it. Well, planning for 2023, this the early booking deadline had already passed. Um, but if you're still thinking about some corn and want to uh, chat with me about it, we can we can still figure out a plan that would work for you. And lastly, we were this year we became Cantera members, and this brought in the opportunity to uh, uh, sell some canola. So these are the top products that uh, that we kind of see are leading edgers in their product line. You have the 4000 Liberty Link series has a great shatter rating or shatter scale rating. Um, then you have the 23 Roundup Ready. It's a great swath only variety, big yielder. The 3100 True Flex, it's their newest variety and has a their highest rating on the shatter scale. And then another, lastly, the 2800 Clearfield. So Right now, the Clearfield varieties, they have a little bit of a, a leading edge in the, in the market compared to other canolas. So if it works for your program, this is definitely something that you can look into. It's a great product. So now we'll get into the forage trials uh, that I did for 2022. First off, we'll start with the fall crop trials. I uh, it took the hybrid rye off at the food stage, milk stage, and then also had an opportunity cut uh, for, at the second cut after the food stage. We had some regrowth from watering and some opportunity or opportune rains. I also took the Tadius triticale and the winter wheat off at the soft dough stage. Tadius won the trial overall, and KW, KWS Serafino at the milk stage came in second. All right, hybrid fall rye. Hybrid fall rye gives you a lot of, lots of options for silage. It can, you can take it off of the boot cut, second cut after boot, and then milk stage cut. So that's second cut after boot. It, you're generally looking around 60 to 70 percent regrowth so if that's something that works for you then it's definitely it's definitely an option so serafino is the best hybrid for dual purpose great for forage and excellent grain yield potential tedious winter triticale so it's releases fall of 2023 um it's great for irrigation and areas with decent rain it's got very good winter hardiness uh, and great tonnage potential, as you saw in that chart that was there before. This picture is just a field that's just west of our, our yard here. And excited to see uh, the potential that comes from it. These are the, the trials that I took for the barley and soft wheat products that we represent. Um, the, uh, they're both taken off at the soft dough stage as well. And CDC, Austinson, AB, Toefield, and Esmo won the trials. They all kind of finished neck and neck right there. Um, for the soft wheats, they, they finished identical. Um, and one thing I will say is we, we have AC Sadash that was missed in this trial. So, but the oats in that, in this trial, they were not taken from a plot, they were taken from 
production field just to see the, well, the potential that we could get from them. So something to keep in mind. And if you're looking for like another second crop option after hybrid fall awry, forage sorghum is a definite possibility. It has a great forage potential and you can also graze it depending on if you got cattle and stuff like that. This the pictures below this, this was taken from a producer that tried this out just south of Barnwell area. And it, uh, they, were, they were grazing it and I, I believe they were quite happy with it, so. The second crop oats, it's always a great option to get as much tonnage off your, off your field as possible after uh, doing a hybrid fall rye. So when double cropping oats, a forage oat is not needed as they are longer season and can be a risk for double cropping, just for frost issues. But if you have any questions on that, we can definitely help you out. So cover crop funding through RDR, this opened up this past August and it for now it's closed, but the window will open up again, February 13th, 2023. Each farm is allocated a maximum of 75,000. So keep this in mind. It's definitely a great option if, if it can work with your rotations. Um, Cover crop programs were created alongside two, this, it was created along two, two others, the rotational grazing and the 4R nitrogen management to expand farmers' best management, best management practices to help uh, with sustainability in agriculture. If you're planning to plant a fall crop and, and plan to chop it in the coming year, this, this could be an option for you. So that is uh, something that is accepted within the program. And if you have any questions about what is and what is not accepted, I can help you out alongside that. So we, alongside with Imperial Seeds, we do a lot of different cover crop blends that can help soil health, uh, are great for grazing. It gives you a lot of different options that with uh, growing potentials, um, but they, also can be used for stability with erosion. So in Southern Alberta, we have wind erosion, which can really be an, a real issue, but there's, there's a lot of options that you can get in, in the fall if you have the time for it, that can help keep your soil where it's at. So below is just a, a, a variety of different products that we can blend for you. Here's just another, uh, slide on the wind erosion. So if you seed in late August, like you can see the pictures above there, uh, you can get like a radish that has a nice deep tap root that gives good stability. Um, other products like buckwheat and facilia, they, and Italian ryegrass is actually a really good one as well. Um, if you mix those all together, it's something that could benefit you for going forward. So um, springtime in front of uh, specialty crops, lots are doing oats and barley. So if that's something that you haven't done in the past, then you can chat with us and we can get a plan together for you. And just new forage ideas uh, going forward. This uh, AEC Truman, it's a great product, um, has really good drought resistance, um, deep deep rooted. So keep that in mind. Um, the boost alfalfa, it's uh, another great option. And then catapult Timothy. So this is from Brett Young Seeds and it's a uh, top yielder has aggressive growth. So um, could be good use for forage and or grazing if possible, but a lot of good options right there. And that's it. So if there's any other questions. Anyone need Blair to go back or or you guys are all, all good over there? Otherwise I'll, I'll share my screen and pull my presentation up. Okay. Hey. Yeah, I'll stop.
Okay. Is that looking all right, Blair? Yep, it's looking good. Okay. Just gotta drag one thing off the screen over here. Oh. <laughs> ah, I think it'll be okay. Okay. So I'll get started talking about uh, what I've got. Uh, so I'm going to cover seed treating, inoculants, all the varieties, <laughs> general, our general varieties, um, and, and a few upcoming varieties as well. And, and then a few marketing options, some grain trials, and then uh, net returns by crop, just kind of how I see it based on some assumptions and guesses. And, and then some new crop options and ideas uh, that I might have for you. So, so we'll get rolling. I'm Greg Stamp, by the way, if uh, you're just joining. So um, basically on the treating side of things, um, fungicides, insecticides, polymer coatings. The polymer coatings has kind of gone by the wayside because of some new inoculants that have a longer lifespan on the seed. So this uh, egg teeve, uh, there's a product that they've got uh, called uh, Fuel, I believe it is. And uh, they changed the name from what I have in this picture. And it's good for on seed, on pulses, peas, lentils, fabas for up to 30 days. Um, if it's warm out, you, you uh, uh, actually, my next slide has some of that information. I'll get to that next slide. Um, so we're actually in the process of building another seed treater. Matthew, my brother, is working on that so that we can actually double the treating speed of our general crops. For pulses, it might not be what we put through that machine, but it'd be more of a cereal machine. So twice the speed uh, of seed treating is the goal with that machine that he's working on, hoping to have rolling this spring. Um, trucking is a challenge this, this year, as you probably know, but just trying to plan trucking in the springtime, uh, you may want to get seed home sooner rather than later. Um, we have a company that we work with that can ship treated seed if you want to get treated seed home in your bin ready to roll. And I would do it sooner than later because of the challenges of lining up trucks, uh, just a lack of them. And the cost is more than last year. Um, and then treating, we can treat year round. Uh, we aim to do it above zero so you don't get any flaking off if that treatment freezes on the seed. Uh, but typically the grain in our bin is, is five, 10 degrees. So you, you're not treating really cold seed, but we aim for above zero. And you do get the rebates from the seed treatments. Um, as far as inoculant goes, yeah, 30 days on seed, no polymer needed, uh, typically cheaper than granular inoculant. So this is a single strain product. It's, so it's not a dual, like there, there, there's some other products out there, but this is good on seed. Um, if it's warmer than 20 degrees, you've only got 20 days on your truck until you get it in the ground. Um, if it's, if it's cooler than 12 degrees, uh, if it's, or if it's just 12 degrees or cooler, you've got, you've got 30 days on seed before that inoculant loses, uh, the, the viability or enough of them on the seed. And uh, yeah, we can treat uh, on demand in the springtime, as you can see here. And lentil rates is even cheaper than pea rates. You need less inoculant on the lentils and it's per acre, not per bushel, which is different. That's kind of unique to this product. So, so, it's, uh, so we kind of need to know how many acres you're covering with the seed you're picking up as well. So as far as wheats go uh, in the midge tolerant lineup, now in Southern Alberta, we don't really have a midge issue. Uh, there's basically maybe Brooks area had, had something maybe 10, 15 years ago, but really it's not a, an issue here, but people are just growing these varieties and we're growing them just because they're good varieties. So the midge varieties have come a long ways and, and are some of the top varieties in the marketplace. So, so basically ones that we have available are Leroy, uh, it, it's, it's sold well last year, uh, good disease package yields. Well, uh, we've got adamant, uh, Oh, I have a mistake there. Adamant VB. Um, it's a, a solid stem for sawfly. So if you're on dry land, you may want to consider this for the best hard red on dry land when you need a sawfly protection. Um, it wasn't in our trial, uh, but that's available if you need it. Um, Wheatland VB, uh, that one has been probably one of our best sellers in the last few years, and it's just a consistent variety and stands well and, uh, intermediate for Fusarium and Rust. So it's, it's okay for that. Um, something like Hodge would be kind of the next step. It's brand new and it's a little better for those disease, that disease package. 
And Hodge was the highest yielding hard red spring wheat or CWRS ever registered in Western Canada. So it's, it's quite the variety. Now, standability, I would say Hodge is kind of like Brandon. It's, it's not perfect. It's not going to be as good as the Wheatland or the Hockley, but it's, uh, it's an excellent variety. Um, lots of our dryland customers go in that route or areas where you need the varietal blend for the Mitch protection. Uh, irrigation, definitely. I've got a few customers that are booked for irrigation, but, uh, it, you know, a PGR is probably recommended on that one on irrigation, uh, just because uh, it's not quite, uh, not quite as good as the Wheatland or Hockley. And then as far as the non-midge tolerant hard red spring wheats, uh, uh, the PT5003, that's not available right now. That comes out next year. So look for that next year for an early maturing good standing variety kind of looks like brandon for sandability uh the hockley that's brand new this year it's been selling quite well um you know potentially higher yields versus view field um high protein good fusarium package with low dawn uh infection when you if there is a fusarium risk year uh it's a longer season so uh but stands excellent so for irrigation that's that's been a, a good go-to along with that wheatland and then Brandon still selling that industry standard. If you like Brandon, that's not a problem. We can get you some Brandon. Uh, <laughs> and then Redberry uh, still have a little bit of Redberry left, but that's kind of going by the wayside. PT5003 will replace that next year. But Redberry, um, it's early, has good grade retention, but uh, lodging risk is a problem with Redberry. So. so moving into soft wheats, uh, a lot of people are growing them for for feed, ethanol, distilling, and, and a little bit for milling as well. There are some milling markets out there for these, but mainly silage is our main, main customer for this. Uh, so you've got the AAC Awesome. That's been a, a hot seller for us. Um, some years it's a bit taller than the other varieties. If you look at this trial, it was pretty neck and neck with the Sadash and the Paramount. So, so in some situations, and this had a PGR in these plots, uh, 40 plants per square foot. So we're trying to show some lodging here. And, and, and because we want to see some logging differences, we may have overdone it in this trial a little bit with some of the barley varieties, but, uh, but anyways, we're seeing some differences. Um, so the awesome, uh, just highest yield ever registered for, uh, for a wheat period, uh, for a spring wheat period. So it, 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 it's, uh, an excellent variety. It's a GP class or SP class. So it's not a soft white. So for milling, it's not the variety for you. For everything else, it's excellent. So a lot of, lot of silage customers and grain customers using that, but just not for, for milling, for the milling market. Sadash or Paramount would be the, the soft white milling varieties, but silage yields excellent for that. Um, Sadash, we kind of went back to it. So a few years ago, we kind of went away from it towards Paramount. A few customers were asking, hey, you know, I think Sadash was actually still pretty good. So we kind of have both available, but we're going back to Sadash, uh, just, just pure top end yield. Disease package on Sadash isn't as good as the other ones, but, you know, people can manage that a bit. And, uh, and so standability, top end yield, Sadash is still so hard to beat even after kind of going away from it. I, I guess we're sorry we're coming back. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry to Sadash, but uh, we're, we're back. <laughs> um, when you do your crop insurance, if you don't grow soft wheats or GP soft wheats, um, if you pick up the awesome and you're used to growing Paramount or Sadash, uh, keep in mind for with AFSC, it's a different class. So make sure you elect to grow those classes of wheats that you may not have grown in the past. So keep that in mind. And then their VBs, so a major agreement is needed, which means you can only farm save one year off certified because to protect the, the traits of the midge. So you always have refuge in there to, so that the midge don't become resistant to the refuge in these varieties. So on Durham, we've got a few midge tolerant ones and, and a few not. Um, so Succeed VB, that's been kind of one of my favorites on irrigation over the years, just because of standability um uh, early it's as much as five or more days earlier than some of these durham varieties so you're going to get that through the combine faster um we've grown it on dry land as well and had good results with it on dry land but it's a big seed size variety so so when you look at the the seeding rates it's like oh yeah you, you need to keep the seeding rate up on that one just because the seed size is 20 percent bigger than than the next durham variety it's kind of crazy that way 
Um, these are all MS for Fusarium, so that's that's uh, um, good. Um, we've got Stronghold stands really well also and seems to perform well on irrigation. Just that that ramps up for that top end yield potential with moisture, PGRs, and and uh, uh, high populations. Uh, for dryland, though, it's been successful because of the solid stem for sawflies. So if you need a sawfly variety, that's a good option. Uh, Donlow, um, it's a hollow stem, so it doesn't have that sawfly protection, but it's got an excellent uh, disease package for Fusarium. So we've been going with Donlow where, you know, there has been years where there's been bad Fusarium years. Uh, it hasn't been the last five or so, but prior to that, it was kind of a disaster for a few years for Fusarium. So um, something to keep in mind to spread your risk uh, might be a good option with, with the Donlow. Uh, Wayburn is new this year. We're making that one available to customers uh, by bringing some in if need be. Uh, it's a solid stem for sawfly. It's got the VP for midge. So it's kind of got it all. A little more lodging pressure. So if you're going to do it on irrigation, watch your plant populations. Don't get too high and, and use a PGR for sure. Or in dryland, you'd be fine on dryland with that variety. So, so Wayburn's a good option. And then gold net, uh, we sold a lot of that gold net last year. Uh, it's a hollow stem, so dry land, watch for that. A little bit of lodging and irrigation, as you can see there. Um, so watch that as well. And then just an S rating for Fusarium head blight. So not quite as good as the other varieties, uh, but maybe you're not in a, a high risk area. It, it's okay for you there. Uh, we also had Vanta in the trial. It's not available in the marketplace yet. It, it did well or it, did, it, did, it didn't do as well as the rest, but I've seen it do excellent in other trials. So I think we might give it one more year, see how it fares. Uh, bacterial blight seemed to be a little bit more of a challenge on that variety, but I don't know if it's the variety itself. It, it could be just the seed lot. So that's one concern uh, that I think we're just gonna try it one more time and, and see how it looks because it's really, really short stature and a little long season though. It was very long in our trial as well. And feel free to jump in with questions if anyone has something as we're going. So um, here we're on to flax. So with the brown flax, so the flax market, you know, it was insane last year. This year, it's still pretty strong, uh, but not quite where it was last year. Um, so sales are chugging, chugging away on both, both flax types, but uh, not quite where it was last year. Um, CDC Roland, it's, it's the top yielding brown flax. We grew this variety beside Marvelous and Marvelous was kind of similar to glass from our experience. So, so some of those existing flax varieties, um, you can see that chart on the page there, that's AFSC's yield magazine. Uh, the, the newest one's not out yet, but it, you know, it's not perfect. This, this information is not, not your only information, but it does show Roland looking pretty good versus the other varieties. Um, but, but you know, I don't think it's gonna be that much ahead of those varieties. Um, when we grew it side by side, it was maybe 5% advantage versus, versus Marvelous, but that's quite a jump. You don't see that kind of yield gains in flax varieties very often because the flax, you know, doesn't get a lot of breeding put into flax either. So those yield gains that we saw with Roland was, was amazing. Now it's a very long season. So watch for that. It's longer than most other flax varieties, but it's, it's, it's the variety to grow in my opinion. Uh, when it comes to yellow flax, Dorado has been around for a few years and it's always performed really well. Seems to do even better under higher moisture or irrigation. Uh, it's on the early side and, and yield potential is close, very close to the browns. I was surprised how good it was compared to the browns. So uh, sometimes that market has some premiums. They'll pass, you know, right now, maybe dollar, two dollars premium to browns. Um, you know, a year ago it was $5 or more, but I don't think we'll see quite that stretch, uh, in, in, in the near term, but, uh, it's got high ALA oil content and a few buyers are looking for that type of oil content. So we can connect you to a buyer looking to contract yellow if you would like to try some and then seed treatment. So I don't know if you're going to make, uh, you know, more money by treating your flax, for sure. That's, it's not a, it's not a hard sell on the treatment here. Uh, a few, a lot of customers do go with the insure pulse, uh, on flax. Um, it's, uh, not a water-based treatment. It's a glycol-based treatment. So you don't get that gumming up. So the flax still flows quite nicely. It's, uh, um, yeah, we're using it on our flax. Um, maybe it gets that flax a little bit faster, a little more even out of the ground, maybe a little more flax past the flowering. 
Um, maybe you can get a few more plants to survive versus without treatment. But it's uh, to me, I haven't seen a ton of data in Alberta that shows it's a clear yes to treat flax. But I'll probably almost 25% of our customers are, are doing the, the treatment on the flax. But it's a little slower to treat, so and we need more time to clean it out. So if you do want treated flax, uh, do give us a warning or give us a get it booked so that we know your pickup will take a little longer versus uh, just shipping it bare. So on peas, we've got uh, CDC Lawashko, new to us this year, but it's been in the market for a couple of years now. It's uh, a smaller seed size like meadow, but it's a little higher yielding uh, versus meadow. And uh, seed coat breakage is good, kind of like the meadow. So uh, stands well, yields well, and some buyers are paying a little more for higher protein. So in Southern Alberta, um, uh, oh, I'll think of their name. Oh, what's the... Oh, Wilson Siding, the, the Pulse was LA Green. Uh, so the LA Green facility at Wilson Siding, Alberta Pulse Traders, they were paying, uh, they're looking to do a program and contract this variety right now. So if you need information, I can connect you with them. But uh, uh, if you know of LA Green at Wilson Siding there, they're, they're wanting to buy Lawachco and contract it right now for next year. So talk to them. Uh, otherwise, you can grow it, just grow the variety and try and sell it for a premium with higher, higher um, protein. But uh, yeah, I've seen some advantages there. Uh, for pure top end yield under irrigation, chrome is hard to beat. Um, where you've got medium season, medium moisture to good moisture, uh, it's phenomenal. Or you catch a rain mid season, I've seen it double the yield of other pea varieties on dry land. But if you don't catch that mid season rain, then it's not quite as good as an early season. So you could you know win or lose with something like that on dry land. But if you're medium moisture to good it's hard to beat uh, but seed coat breakage is a challenge with it so that is one negative to the variety but uh just I mean, yield does pay the bills so uh that's that's one interesting thing with that variety um profit it's available if you need that variety carver available if you need that variety uh we haven't done a whole lot with those varieties in the past but our main two would be the lawachko and the chrome and then uh, Delhi Jumbo Yellow available if you need it. Um, large seed size, um, stands decent, early season. Uh, and there are some specialty contracts and buyers that are looking for that variety specifically. Um, up and coming in that world, uh, there's, I'm, I've got a new variety called Julius. It's a couple of years out. And uh, so you can't buy it this coming fall. It's the next fall. So we're two years out from the Julius. So, or a year and a half. Unfortunately, because it looks very good. Uh, other pulses, we've got the Forage P DL Lacrosse. So if you want to blend that with oats or or things like that, it's quite early. It would be a replacement or an option versus the for, the older 4010s. It's a white flower though, so it looks different in the field. It's a little more vertical in the field versus the 4010. It'd be a little more horizontal and, and viney. The lacrosse is a little more vertical and looks almost like a normal pea, but it is a great forage pea. Um, maple peas, if you need a maple pea, that market is hot. We are sourcing maple pea varieties for people. We were doing uh, some maple peas in the past, but what we found was buyers were very specific on what they wanted. And it's like, we never had the right variety, <laughs> you know? So, so basically there's three or four or five maple pea varieties out there. If you have a buyer looking to do some, we can source some seed for you. Um, green peas, forest, uh, good yield, strong seed coat. If you want to get in some greens, we can make some available for you. Um, greens hit and miss, uh, you know, last few years, it hasn't been that popular. Uh, now the green, green price is a little better than yellow again. So that's usually how it goes over the years. And then chickpeas, if you need chickpea, Palmer is a little better disease package versus some of the existing chickpeas. So, uh, that's a good option for you. If you want to try some chickpea. Lentils. Um, I love this lentil chart on the right. This one is what we've seen kind of from customers as far as yield potential, but it's still amazing to me how many people are still growing Maxim red lentil. It was a great variety, but if you look at every single year, you could be making 50 to $90 per acre more by buying Proclaim variety. So I just, phenomenal. I mean, maybe people just don't know how good the other varieties are, but it's, uh, yeah, every single year you'd be making more money by growing Proclaims. And uh, and then Simi is the new up and coming variety. So we've got Simi available as well. 
it's going to be similar to, I think, a little better than Proclaim. So probably half our sales are semi, half are Proclaim this year. Uh, we'll see how it compares to Proclaim. Um, you know, similar to slight yield advantage over Proclaim, but very similar plant look to Maxim. Proclaim was also similar, but semi is even more so. And then green lentil, if you need a green, you know, worth more money, a little more cost to grow. Um, so like a lentil, like a red lentil is like half the cost to grow a pea per acre when you factor in seeding rates, treatments, inoculants, you're, you're half the price or less to grow a lentil versus a pea. So that can lower your risk a little bit. And lentils can be worth more per acre versus peas. Uh, and then the green lentils, higher seeding rate versus red. So kind of, a, you know, 1.5 times the rate, a little more cost to the seed as well. But that market class is worth more right now as well. So, but maybe a little more risk with downgrading if you get rains in the fall or, or things like that. The reds are a little more foolproof versus the greens. So, more risk, more reward. That's how it goes. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, and we can we can do the uh, uh, you know seed treats inoculants on there. So all you have to do is put it in your drill and away you go. But really good response from the green lentil from Lima people saying that it was really outperforming their traditional greens that were not clear fields. So, uh, but you get the clear field advantage with that, which is worth something to some people, but yeah, definitely clear field is a challenge sometimes. Uh, I've got a new winter pea that we're, we're growing right now. Um, this was on canola stubble. So that's why you can see there's a little bit of volunteer canola coming there. Uh, that's the only field we had available with the right rotation to plant that on early enough this fall. Uh, that was planted uh, early September, and I think that's key with the winter peas because they need to get to a certain size to survive the winter. If you take a look over here, that was under the pivot. It got to that size. You got a few tillers and branching branches here and uh, amazing root nodulation. So that's quite phenomenal that you can fix that much. And you know, it was a good fall, but uh, we did inoculate them, but that's a lot of end fixation in the fall. Um, so maybe there's even a home in, in cover crops and things like that to fix a little end for something like this. It'll grow quite a long period through the winter, right? And then maybe you go plant your normal crop after that uh, next spring. Here, this little plant, it wasn't in the, the moisture this fall. We didn't get a lot of rain this fall. So this guy just got some rain late in the fall. So you can see how small it was kind of on the edge there. Um, still grew. And then this one, same thing, was right on the edge. Didn't get the moisture and didn't grow till quite a bit later. Um, I think fungicide insecticide is key to help them survive the winter and survive the stress of winter and uh yeah getting that big plant uh that's important as well um this pea will look like a normal yellow pea so you'll be able to sell into normal pea markets is our expectation and uh so a few more years uh, before it will be available to farmers because we only have seven acres in the ground right now but if it can survive the winter consistently, this could be pretty awesome for, for the, the pulse market. So faba bean, um, fabas are not susceptible to menophyces. So if you have root rot issues on your land, faba beans are a good option as your pulse rotation to stretch your pea or, or lentil rotation. Now they need moisture, they need that late season moisture. So Southern Alberta irrigation, Central Alberta, Saskatchewan, that higher moisture zones of the province. Uh, medium to high moisture because they need that uh, to, to get your optimum yields there. This variety, it's low visine, con visine. So it's actually quite in high demand for protein fractionation programs, pulse flower programs. It's the it's high yielding. You know, I think it's about 5% better than the other varieties that are out there like the snowbirds. And so you get some yield advantage, you get some pricing advantage and some stable markets with protein fractionators. So there's a, uh, Quite a good opportunity with this variety. So do let us know if you're interested in trying some fabas. Uh, a lot of opportunities here, I feel. Um, and the feed, they're, they're, they have tannin, but they're lower. And so feed is a, is a backup if you do have a frost wreck. Um, so yeah, quite a good option. If you just want to grow something for feed, the 219-16, smaller seed size versus snowbird. So your seeding costs, treatment, all that. 20% lower or more versus a snowbird with similar yield potential. So if you know you're just in the feed market, just grow the 219.16s, easier to plant, lower cost to plant, and uh, yeah, yields just as good. Or cover crops as well. Um, it's, it's lots of people using it for that. 
Uh, so winter wheat, uh, you know, we're not that far away from winter wheat sales season, are we, Blair? <laughs> uh, we, had, we had someone, Blair had someone book some uh, Serafino hybrid rye just the other day, actually. So it's, uh, you can book seed whenever, whenever you like. We didn't have a price for him, but uh, um, you can get on the, on the list for some of these varieties. <laughs> um, with uh, wildfire, that's kind of your industry standard. Um, you know, good winter hardiness good yields. Uh, it's long season, like a very long season. So that's the only downside with that really. Uh, and then a little bit of powdery mildew on irrigation shows up once in a while with this variety. So uh, a late fungicide sometimes is required on irrigation. So watch for that. Uh, network is another newer option, a little shorter stature, um, high protein, good winter survival, and a uh, good rust package. Um, and kind of, I think that will replace both of these varieties is the cold front. That'll be available, not this fall, but I think the following fall. So um, you can't buy it this year, but the next year you'll be able to. And cold front looks phenomenal. Uh, higher yield than both of these, better standability versus the wildfire. Um, it's got radiant and it's genetics. Everyone loved radiant. North Star, some dryland people really loved the North Star. So it's got some real unique genetics and I think it's gonna be a phenomenal variety for everywhere <laughs> kind of a, a western canada variety that's kind of got it all so really excited about that variety rob graf the breeder that's in that picture there is really pumped about it so and then the hybrid rise um we've got another awesome yield trial in the ground this year to test some forage yields and some grain yields of some new hybrid rye varieties and and the, the tedious fall triticale and our winter wheat so real excited for that um but you know why would you want to grow hybrid rye well better lodging resistance versus other rye. um it would have uh, uh higher yield potential versus traditional rye, and uh, as much as 20 to 40 percent yield advantage which is phenomenal uh can be lower risk versus some others as well the key to lower ergot risk though is planting early, reducing tracks in crop by either not spraying or spraying very early and having an even field, an even stand, an early planted stand, that's all gonna help you reduce your, your ergot risk in rye. Um, the feed increase, that's that's been increasing. Um, typically it sells at a slight discount to say winter wheat or other feed crops. But even with that, the yield potential is so much higher, especially in dry conditions, but even on irrigation, the yield potential is so, such more than winter wheat or other feed crops that you can take a little bit less on the dollar value and still be netting more money in your pocket at the end of the day, growing a hybrid fall rye, even for feed. And, and so, so yeah, really, uh, and, and really Serafino has kind of been our go-to for forage and grain. It's just that it just does so well for everything. So, so yeah, we'll have Serafino available again this year. Um, and most pro power people are switching over to Serafino. So um, you could double crop behind either of them with the oats or, or barley um, uh, behind both those varieties. And obviously the earlier you take it off, uh, but you could get stuff off mid-May and you could, uh, um, you know, I've had dairies take, take it off at boot at mid-May or late May, I guess, late May or milk stage in mid-June come in with a second crop and get an excellent silage crop after that. So, so definitely we can help you come up with some ideas if you're new to that side of things on actually how to do it. And the winter triticale, we've been selling some Metzger. It's got some height, so probably best on dry land. Uh, the Tadius, um, I think it may do okay on dry land, but we don't really know yet. Um, it's from Europe and in Europe, they said, you know, it had some good drought tolerance, but I don't know if European drought tolerance is the same as Southern Alberta drought tolerance. So we'll, we'll see. I'm sure there'll be a few customers that'll want to try it on, on dry land and we'll get some good information from them, but currently ours is on irrigation. So we won't have a whole lot of information for you dr drought resistance wise. Um, it's a European variety, uh, certified seed use only targeting that forage market. Uh, it's got very large seed size. So uh, seeding rates might be a little higher but it's a phenomenal, unique looking crop. I'm so excited. I already have a booking for this from this, like this fall from September. I didn't have a price for him, but, but, I, but he said, I, I know I want some, so put me down for, for this many bushels. And I said, you betcha, I will. <laughs> uh, Cause we can start selling this summer. So um, amazing grain yields. Uh, it was phenomenal. Um, it's excellent standability. Um, 
yeah, low fusarium risk. And there is a high sprouting risk with it, but I mean, that's not the goal with this variety. So, so not a, not a big issue other than for guys like us who are growing the seed. Um, you know, we don't want to sprout before it hits your soil. So <laughs> we'll, we'll watch for that. <laughs> um, for spring triticale, uh, the Sunray has been a great seller for us. Not a lot of people are selling Sunray anymore. I think maybe we might be the only seed grower selling it. And uh, it's got a softer on. It's got ons, but it's got a softer on. You could harvest this for grain if you like. It's a phenomenal yielder. Or you can use uh, the... I'm just going to see if I can turn that sound off. There we go. Um, no, pause the video too. Um, it's on the early side of things for maturity. Uh, lots of people silaging it. Uh, some are even doing some swath grazing with it, which I was surprised. I, I asked if there was any issues with uh, lockjaw. Or I think it's called lockjaw in in cattle. And uh, it, uh, yeah, the, the, the customer said he didn't have any issues with that. So I, I was okay. That's great. <laughs> uh, but that's always a concern with something that has ons. But it's got a kind of a softer on, but not a smooth on um yeah good option we're about half sold out on that sunray spring triticale right now so and doing well in the trials still actually it did phenomenal in in the gateway research organization trial so uh thanks to that area research group for for doing these trials barley's lots of options for you so we're going to go through all four sections of this barley slide separately here uh, these are all all the options here. I'll flip over to the next one. And uh, yeah, there's just so many options. So exciting. <laughs> We've got these European style uh, feed barley. So in Europe, they're actually malt varieties, but here they're just registered as feed varieties. Actually, the Sirish is registered as a malt here, but uh, no real, no maltsters are buying it. Just it, it's not fitting their programs typically uh, that, that I know that I know of. Um, so on that bottom picture, we got Esma uh, with a PGR versus Austinson with a PGR. The Esma is going to stand up a better at the same plant stand and yield more versus something like an Austinson. So on irrigation or medium to good moisture, um, I would say these two varieties are the way to go. On dry land in Southern Alberta, I may not recommend these for you. Uh, you might get some yield loss. Uh, just because they seem to drop off when it's really, really dry. Um, yeah, I would say 10, 15% yield advantage over other varieties. Um, the Sirish responds to fertility and fungicides phenomenally. Uh, if I had to pick a variety grown irrigation and just both of them are excellent for, for barley for a feed. Um, so Bill Coors 100, um, these malt varieties. So all the, on the right, there's all these malt varieties that, uh, we have available for you. If you'd like to try one of them, that the information for Cody Schick from most Molson Coors, he doesn't have a malt contract yet. He said he's very close. So you can talk to him. He's out of Montana and contracting in Southern Alberta on irrigation. So, um, if you're outside of Southern Alberta, you can still grow this. Just talk to your Canada malt buyer and Canada malt. Uh, you can contract this variety with Canada malt. Talk to them. It's a phenomenal variety. Super early, up to five days earlier than or more than anything else that we grow for barley. So you can get it through your combine faster. Low plant populations. It's bred out of the Molson Coors breeding program in the United States. Uh, 20 plants per square foot on irrigation is our target. So you could see this a little lower than your typical barley seeding rate that you're used to. Uh, just because of the way it, the plant structure is different than our our Canadian malt barleys. So yeah, customers have really enjoyed these programs and, and the pricing has been, it's malted in Canada. So you don't have to deal with any of that. Uh, Cody's program, it's picked up at your bin and taken to Calgary for malting. And uh, yeah, phenomenal malt programs. Um, and, and really attractive pricing versus the feed market as well. And uh, so the other option would be Synergy. That's kind of been a good flex variety, you know, dry land forage or dry land for grain or for malt. And uh, because, you know, it yields really well. So if you want to grow it for feed, go for it. If you are growing it for malt, perfect. Uh, either, either way, that's, that's a great variety for, for a broad area of Western Canada. And some people on irrigation are growing it, but definitely some lodging risk there with that one on irrigation. 
And then the other ones, Frazier, that's been a hot seller for us this year. Um, stands well, yields well. People are just going to be growing that for uh, grain as well. But the maltsters are really picking up the contracting and acceptance of Frazier in their programs. And then up and coming is Churchill. Um, that they did well in our trials this year. And we also would have Connect available for you as well if, if you do need that variety. So, um, yeah, lots of great options in the malt world and, and also flex options that yield as good as, as the, the feed varieties. Now on to feed varieties, uh, some of the traditional ones. Um, AB Hag is a new one. It, sh it was showing some drought resistance uh, on some dry land. We, we, some of the reps we're talking about uh, from FP Genetics, um, you know, yield advantage over Austin Sand, I think is a little bit of that as well. And some lodging risk on irrigation, but Austin Sand also has that on irrigation. And for silage, it was performing quite well in some of the silage trials. You know, take it for what it is, those trials maybe aren't, aren't perfect, but uh, yeah, some, some advantage with it in the silage market. And then Austinson, as usual, uh, Canmore is available if you really like that variety. Um, and then next year, 2023, we'll be launching Renegade. So fall, you know, next fall, we can start selling this Renegade variety. It's going to yield kind of like Austinson. Um, standability, I think, is a little on the weak side. So perfect for dry land irrigation, maybe not perfect, uh, but it's a smooth on. So you can, you can use it like a Maverick. It would replace Maverick, higher grain yield versus Maverick. And, and forage yields are excellent for it as well with that smooth on and, and great disease package that MR for physarium. That's great. Uh, same MR for smuts. Um, so yeah, a little tall versus Austinson still, but uh, that's going to be a hot variety this fall when we start selling that one, that renegade. And then the six row smooth ons. Uh, we've dealt with all these varieties here over the past few years. Um, I think I got the wrong picture in there actually though, but I'll have to change that out. Um, toe field, that's our new one. It's the shortest stature of these six rows. Um, stands the best from what we've seen and, and great grain yields as well, if you just wanna go for grain. But for forage yields where you need to smooth on, toe field's kind of the one to go to at, at this point. Uh, still, still lots of interest in Cadillac, Advantage, great varieties. Uh, but toe field's kind of our, our new up and coming variety, a little weak on the physarium head blight, uh, side of things, uh, all of these, but, um, great forage varieties or grain. If you really like to grow a six row for grain, just keep in mind, six rows are lower bushel weight when it does get dry. Uh, so dry land for grain is a kind of a no, no in Southern Alberta for sure. Uh, as far as oats, um, We've got the Arborg Oats. Um, that one's been a good, good hit in our lineup. Uh, great for milling, uh, good for forage, good for double cropping. It's kind of that all well-rounded variety. It's not super short, but it does stand quite well. Uh, stands similar to Camden. Uh, Camden's available if you really want that one. Um, and then like Blair said, uh, when you're double cropping, we've got, uh, we're recommending shorter season varieties. Typically, the double croppers don't care about the quality as much. It's typically going into a silage pit. So the quality is not as big of a deal where the haymaker, you don't need the quality of a haymaker forage oat. You just need to get that tonnage. Um, then we would recommend a shorter season variety like an Arborg versus a haymaker for that double cropping just because you can get it in the pit faster with more tonnage when the quality is not as important. If you need the quality, go for the haymaker. That's fine. We've got haymaker available as well. Hard white spring wheat. Uh, so we're we're uh, making so this so this this program. So we're working with Rogers Foods. If you want to grow some cirrus, so cirrus will be the main one this year, actually. That Rogers Foods will be contracting. Uh, I think we're going to grow some more iceberg. We're we're low on supply, so there's actually no. I don't think I can sell any iceberg actually to you right now. Uh, all, we need all of it for our own multiplication because it's uh, registered status actually. Um, but the Cirrus, so Rogers Foods, um, it sounds like they're gonna have a pretty decent contracting program this year. Um, the, the varieties stand quite well. They yield, they look kind of like, you know, hard reds in the field, but it's, it's a more niche program, uh, niche market. And if you wanna get connected with them to see what their contracts are all about, we've got Cirrus seed available. And, and limited supply, we don't have that much actually, but Rogers Foods, uh, I know was going to get some acres in the ground of that Cirrus and they're out of BC and they do some milling and uh, good guys to work with. So 
So please uh, talk to us about that. Mustards, we are sold out of the hybrids, the AAC Brown uh, 18 and the uh, AAC Yellow 80. Phenomenal varieties, but we're sold out, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a hot mustard year. Um, so if, if you, I've got the, uh, oh, I don't have the other, uh, oh yeah, I do have that. So the options would be then Centennial, uh, bare or treated on this on the on these varieties the centennial and dante and the orientals we can do uh, helix extra and luminarum if you want that luminarum protection which i probably recommend just because flea beetles have been a bit of a nightmare uh in southern alberta or everywhere really the past few years so uh kind of recommending the luminarum so you get the other the cutworm protection but also the uh, uh the striped flea beetle protection as well uh, so, and Dante would be the yellow uh, that's available and, and we can connect you with Johnson's Grain. We've got some great con uh, contracts out on all these varieties and uh, the net returns on mustard looks really good this year. Just watch for how far apart you were from canola being a risk on that field or your combine spitting canola out on that field because you do not want canola in your mustard at all. Um, and uh, it's available in these bag sizes, 50 pounds, 1100 and 2200 pound bags. And, uh, oh, there we go. There's my treatment option. So uh, all types of mustard available. Just give us a ring, but no hybrids anymore. So now we're going to switch into the yield trials and then a few different uh, crop types that uh, we, we would suggest uh, are good options this year. Here's, the, here's what we're going to cover here in this presentation, uh, yield trials and crop ideas. When it comes to the trials, um, this field had high fertility and it was faba bean stubble. So I don't think I'd put quite as much fertility on, especially not on the barleys. We saw lodging showing up, you know, in the wheats, it was okay. We saw some differences in the barleys. We almost saw too much. And uh, so we're gonna try and tame that back a little bit for next year. Uh, Taraxa F4 from BSF on the seed for treatments and our normal in-crop herbicides. And then um, manipulator PGR went across all the plots on the barley, that's part of the reason they didn't stand up quite as good. Uh, Modus would have been a little bit better option on barleys to help uh, keep those standing. Um, and uh, we applied a, a fungicide for Fusarium at, at, at heading on all of these. Now, of course, every variety was a little different stage. So it kind of, the average of the plot got hit. So every variety got a little different timing on that Fusarium spray, just because of maturity differences and going across with the sprayer. Here's our barley plots. Looks fun, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, what we found on, on the barleys was, uh, uh, you know, the highest yields were the Asma Sarish, you know, those European style ones. The Bill Coors did excellent as far as the other non-European style varieties. Um, we've seen that Bill Coors with yields up to one, you know, 130 to 150 bushel range, but I think those European ones are gonna be in the same range as well. So good yields there. And the tow field did quite well also. Now, lodging was a problem in these plots. So if you see some varieties that are lower, maybe they had more lodging risk and uh, that was part of it. I was surprised how well Churchill did in the plots and we didn't have any Fraser in here. I think next year we're gonna put Fraser in the plots as well. So uh, still building the plan for that. So variety wise, those European ones great and uh, the Bill Coors was, was, was pretty good over there as well. On Durham. You can see uh, the, the two, the gold nets and the Wayburn, a little more lodging pressure there. Oh, um, oh I'm gonna go through a few pictures because all of the, uh, these are on the same chart. Your soft wheats, uh, the awesome, maybe a hair more lodging than the other two, but Sadash looks to be the best here. Uh, 40 plants per, so on the barleys, we were 30 plants per square foot target on the cereal, the, the, the wheats, durums and soft wheats and hard reds we were at 40 plants per square foot. So, so it's a high, high plant population and then the PGR and uh, still standing pretty good. But my goal with these plots was let's get as high a yield potential as possible while keeping it standing and how do they perform and compare under that, that, that real aggressive program. And here's our hard red spring wheats. Uh, you can see that wheatland and that Hockley standing very well. And, uh, you know, Brandon actually not too bad, but the other variety is kind of comparable to it, I would say. So as far as top end yield, the soft wheats are, are good there in the middle in, in the browns. Uh, uh, Sadash was, was a little better than the, the rest. Uh, 
and then the awesome is beside it there. And in the, the hard reds, pretty tight pack actually for yields, but the Wheatland uh, kind of the tops there, but very close behind would be the Hawk Clean Hodge. In the, I would say, in all the registration data, it was kind of the opposite. Hockley Hodge, new up and coming high yielders. But every situation, every year, every farm is going to be a little different on how they perform. So, so uh, definitely not counting those varieties out yet. And then, be, you know, close as well, the, the new PT5003. And uh, everything's fairly tight, actually, for yield range. Uh, you know, you're like 103 to, you know, 107 or 8. So it's a pretty tight window. And then as far as Durham's go, uh, the Succeed and Stronghold and Irrigation there were the top two, and they stood very well. So hard to beat those two. Uh, even for next year, it's probably going to be kind of the top two varieties is my thought uh, for next year as well. All of this information is available on our website as well, these charts, uh, stampseeds.com. And then we're going to post this presentation to YouTube after as well. Oh, what a nice picture. Uh, you can see that winter bar. We had some winter barley in the plots. It, the first bit of it kind of froze out over winter, didn't survive well. These were planted a little late, so that's part of it didn't get big enough. We have the winter barley in our plots this year, and it was planted earlier, so it got bigger. So it might have a better chance of actually surviving well. That variety is called Rizuna. It's uh, from Seacan. Uh, Ontario is where they grow that variety. And uh, over here, you can see that uh, Tadius triticale. And then here's the cold front winter wheat over here. They just look phenomenal. Um, and then you got all your hybrid rye, and we've got the winter wheats. And uh, yeah, just a, a little sprayer track or something someone drove through here on a little bit of an angle. So that was a bit of a mistake, but uh, everything else was even across the plots. I just love the look of these plots. Oh, um, on the hybrid rye, um, 18 plants per square foot was the target here. And on the winter wheat, it's 40 plants per square foot. So that's double, right? The hybrid ryes do tolerate a lot more, but they need time to do that. So we were planted a little late to be that low on the hybrid ryes. This year, I think the hybrids had tillered out enough this fall because we were earlier. So we're gonna have a better comparison and should even give the hybrids ryes a better advantage versus the winter wheats uh, this coming year. So if you look at the yield of grain, you've got the Serafino, uh, right up there, uh, kind of like 145, pretty phenomenal there. Um, now, keep in mind, rye is um, a different moisture correction. Uh, wheat is 14.5, rye is dry at 14, and rye's bushel weight is uh, 56 pounds versus winter wheat at 60 pounds per bushel. So not a perfectly direct comparison here. Um, but yeah, Serafino blowing things away in the grain yields. Um, the barley, it was thin, it, it had to retail or refill in. So not a good demo, but it's there. Um, for grain yields, the conventional rye, not great compared to everything else. Uh, it's quite shocking, honestly. Um, and then for the winter wheats, uh, wildfire did decent. Uh, the network was a little behind it. So I think we're gonna be focusing more on wildfire for this year and the following year, a huge launch into cold front. Uh, for So one more year, wildfire is kind of gonna be the lead and then uh, cold front will kind of dominate the, the next year is my thought. Now, manipulator PGR was across all these plots as well, so keep that in mind. All right, net returns by crop. Costs are up this year. Everyone knows that. Uh, I, think the, I think the joke on the picture was these guys just saw their fertilizer bill or something like that, so hopefully it wasn't their seed bill. <laughs> um, what we've got on net returns per crop, um, everyone always asks me, oh, how does it compare to wheat? You know, if I, if I grow wheat here, what about another crop? How does that compare? You know, what are the risks? What are the rewards here? So here is kind of a rough build of if you were to buy these different varieties, how do they all compare? The corn one's not super. I should have Blair help me with that one a little bit because I'm not a corn expert. And uh, oh, we'll fix that for next time because um, I don't think I have that one quite perfect. But but anyways, cost per acre, you know, we're, you know, everyone's costs are going to be on irrigation are going to be 90, 100 bucks an acre more than it was last year. It's crazy, right? Um, but you know, if you do a, a wheat versus so, so costs on a wheat, like say you're 342 bucks an acre on inputs, plus any of your land, rent, machinery, you know, your your infrastructure costs and 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 profits, it's uh, you know, you're you get a lot of costs per acre on irrigation. Now compare that wheat, uh, 340 versus say, uh, you know, a, a faba bean or a pea. 
you know, you're quite a bit cheaper to grow a pulse crop this year because of that nitrogen price. Um, so something to think about, but what the net return is all that really matters. Uh, you know, that's, that's the important part. Um, if you look at faba beans, if, if we can find some $14 faba bean contracts again this year, um, you know, even at 85 bushels, which I think is, is pretty conservative for faba beans on irrigation uh, for this variety, uh, you know, you're looking pretty good versus net. I reduced the residual nitrogen back uh, to lower it down a little bit because I had a little bit high in the past, I thought, and because uh, we don't really account too much for that residual nitrogen in our next year's cropping plans. Um, we just expect a better crop the next year, higher proteins, things like that. Uh, but yeah, it looks like, uh, um, you know, it looks like you've got uh, that, you know, good percentage ahead of wheat with the, with the pulse, with the beans. Peas at 11 bucks doesn't look that hot, honestly. Our pea sales haven't been that strong and maybe that's why. Uh, but, you know, who knows where pea prices will be next year. I'm making a lot of guesses here on prices and yields. Um, you know, maple peas, they look okay. Uh, pretty niche market though. Uh, lentils and irrigation, I don't know if I would do it. I'd rather grow a fab on, on, on a high moisture situation, um, but lentils can be okay. And then the, the feed products or, or you know, the, the fall crops, the hybrid rise, uh, GP weeds, they all look pretty good because the feed markets are still pretty strong. Uh, Durham looks okay. More risk to grow Durham versus a hard red though. So keep that in mind. Um, oats are back down. Barley's still pretty strong, even in eight bucks at 140 bushels. So don't rule barley out on irrigation. Um, and, I, and I think you could contract malt barley for more than that on irrigation uh, for more than eight bucks for a new crop. That's my thought. Um, canola, at 65 bushels. It's okay at $17. You know, you're still, still doing okay there. Uh, Clearfield canolas, if you get some additional dollars out of those guys, even if they yield 10 bushels less, you're still doing pretty good actually. Uh, so that's something to think about uh, on the Clearfield side of things. Flax. Hmm. Good rotation crop maybe this year. <laughs> the, the dollar value there at 20 bucks is not quite where it should be at 45 bushels in my mind. Uh, so maybe we'll see a big correction in flax acres this year. And then corn. Uh, I got $8 for corn. Well, I, I know guys are getting more than, uh, farmers are getting more than $8 right now for corn. And 160 pretty conservative yield, I think, uh, for, a, for a good field. So, so maybe you can meet, yeah. So actually corn probably is going to do better than, then, uh, but you know, I'm thinking new crop, you know, what's corn gonna be next fall. Okay. Maybe it's eight bucks, maybe you bank on 160. And if you get more, you're, you're, you're laughing, but, but yeah, 120% of hard red spring weight. And it's possible there. Dry land, uh, a little hard to do the dry land one. Cause what's the rainfall going to be and what area are you in? My dry land is not the same as your dry land. Uh, my dry land's pretty poor. <laughs> uh, you know, yield potential can be pretty ugly. Uh, so I was pretty conservative on yield potential and, and um, but still building some normal costs in here uh, and have trucking built in here. But if you look at what it costs to grow a lentil on that dry land, maybe 137 bucks of input costs versus say, um, say a wheat or a durum at around 200 bucks. So bit cheaper to grow a pulse crop of, of course uh the peas are more because it's a higher seeding rate lentil a little economical on seeding net returns though um lentil looks okay um you know peas if you assume a 25 bushel pea and 11 dollars versus wheat at uh 11 spring wheat and 30 bushels an acre um that's that's the numbers i'm just going on um take it you know this will be different on your farm uh, Durham looks okay on dry land. Uh, the hybrid rise actually, because they do perform well, even with drought, uh, looks phenomenal on dry land. Um, that's the way it was last year. Uh, people were making more money on, on with the hybrid rye versus winter wheat last year on net returns, uh, is what my customers were telling us. And then barley uh, looks okay if you think you can get 45 bushels at $8 barley new crop. Um, and uh, yeah, can almost look maybe okay. Um, mustard. Phenomenal. Maybe that's why mustard sales are so strong. We may, you know, but there are some still some good new crop contracts out there right now. So you can get 10 bushels an acre signed up at, at a pretty good price. So, you know, that, that may be worth your while to look at if you've got a field suitable for mustard, uh, you know, very clean and uh, no canola history recently. All right. I like the hat. I need one of those. <laughs> uh, 
thoughts on 2023. Um, so pulse crops, the pulse crops look a lot better this year. Uh, we were able to clean everything off the combine and, and do a lot better on, on seed coat. Well, it wasn't as dry. So seed coat breakage isn't as bad of a deal. Um, but we're, we're doing a lot off the combine. Our seed cleaning plant with Matthew there starts, uh, and his team starts, um, basically as soon as our combines start, our seed cleaning plant runs nonstop till Christmas and then on from there. Um, one idea for flax, if you've got gopher problems, the gophers don't like flax. Um, if you have some wild oat issues, watch for that though. You may need to use some avidex to keep those wild oats under control. Uh, if you got some dandelions or thistles though, the, the, the weed control for that is not bad in flax actually with the curtail M. Uh, on irrigation where you want some additional standability, if you stump the crop with two shots of buckthorn M or a curtail buckthorn, you can get a little better standability out of that crop. And then you've got that authority for the broadleaf weed suppression. So you know, flax, flax growing has become a little easier over the past few years because of authority mainly. Um, peas, talked about that dollar premium in some higher protein pea varieties. So, uh, and new varieties are trending smaller in seed size. So as we go forward, we're seeing seed coat breakage being watched a little closer by breeders and, and seed growers as well. And functionality of the varieties, that's probably the next step for fractionation. So for malt varieties, uh, waiting on Cody, uh, we can connect you with him if you didn't get the info. Um, I think that's still a great option because the, the yields, the earliness of this variety and uh, lower N. So, you know, if you're on irrigation, a lot of people follow sugar beets because there's lower nitrogen there typically. Um, but it's nice because you can get your combines in the field faster. We're able to straight cut it. Uh, it, it was doing okay for that. Um, Modus will help you st it stand if, if you're concerned about that. And uh, we, we do typically apply modus to the, our malt barley crops. And, but with malts, you got to watch your, your germ, your purity uh, with, you know, say volunteer wheat in it or things like that and, and chitting. Um, and it's a longer shipping window, but you could price quite a bit of your crop right now uh, with an active God contract with, uh, with malts and coors. So um, it's worth looking at, I think. So faba beans, if you are going to try some faba beans, we had all those slides prior there. Um, it looks like there's a lot of opportunities this coming year for Fabel and faba beans, actually, with a lot of interest and a lot of buyer, a lot of uh, a lot of interest uh, possibilities upcoming. Um, but don't follow flax. You can't kill the flax out of your faba bean crop. Uh, don't grow fabas where you had Montrell, Curtail M, um, Prestige. You will hurt your faba bean crop just don't do it. <laughs> uh, be, be cautious of that. Uh, no matter how much moisture, even irrigation, just don't do it. Uh, they'll fix more nitrogen versus peas. So um, we've seen some, some phenomenal nitrogen fixations from faba beans. They fix all year long. They don't stop. Whereas peas kind of stop at flowering. Fabas just keep going. Um, you know, one bushel of yield, roughly one pounds of actual N left in that field for subsequent crops to use and convert over. But you won't see that in the soil test, right, until it does convert over. So it's a little bit of an abstract number. Um, the, uh, you know, the fab is used more water versus peas or need a little bit of that late season moisture to, to be consistent. So that can be a challenge some years, but in some regions, that's not the case. Uh, they can be just very competitive. And then that aminophyses, if you got that root rot problem the, or complex, uh, the fab beans can be a good solution for you. And a little later harvest in peas, so it can run into some of your other crop timings, whereas, you know, peas are out of the way earlier. So grow that malt barley and then grow the faba bean. That'll solve your problems. Um, lentils and chickpeas, um, you know, watch for too high of nitrogen residuals. That was more of a last year problem. This year, I don't think it's going to be as bad um, because the, the lentils can turn, you know, vegetative a little bit if you have too high of nitrogen and too much rain in the season. Not a Southern Alberta problem necessarily, but uh, uh, some areas, um, you know, chickpeas, they cost a bit to grow. Uh, so that is a challenge. And then, you know, your, your fungicides, it's, it's a challenging crop to grow, not for everyone, but that flax, you know, if you put flax at 10 pounds an acre it, with that chickpea crop, um, reduce your need for fungicides um, and, and maintain that yield potential with the added flax benefit. But yeah, 10 pounds per acre or even a hair, like eight pounds has been what our customers are telling us is working, but they have a root rot risk with the chickpea as well. 
mustards. Um, herbicide carryover is a risk. So watch for that. It was a bigger deal last year, obviously with the drought this year, not quite as bad. Um, watch for group two carryovers. If you're following, um, peas um like you know odyssey would be a risk viper less of a risk i would say um but i i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily follow those crops actually it's much better to actually follow uh, a cereal so um because i think uh maybe you're not even allowed to follow those crops actually i better crop, double check the recrop recropping uh residual risks but um yeah go with uh double checking the recrop residual risk on on pulses so aim for following a cereal um volunteer canola you don't want that in there even if your combine spit it out this past fall is there a risk of that happening then that's a risk for your mustard crop um and if you had to color sort only yellow mustard could potentially be your orientals and browns i mean how are you going to get canola out of those right um and then you know wild mustard is that a weed that's a problem on your farm maybe you don't see it that much anymore but it could still be out there um, you know, so we would do a fall glyphosate typically ahead of mustard and all of our other pulse crops. So typically that will give you the cleanest fields possible, fall glyphosate. And then, uh, um, and then this, in this crop, you know, edge would be a nice one to put down on yellow. You can use authority, uh, at the low rate prior to yellow mustard actually. And then in crop, all you've got is group one. So pick a clean field. That's a challenge. Um, the hybrids, which were sold out on of the mustards, uh, they got they have more top end yield and more yield stability and cleaner samples. So, so definitely there's a trend towards using those varieties as time goes on. Uh, bacterial blight, watch for that in in cereals. Um, on Durham's, we're trying to use dryland seed lots to. Uh, we're going to be using dryland seed lots to reduce the risk of bacterial blight. 2020 and now has a seed test available. Seems to be mostly a problem in Durham's at this point, um, but uh, it's something to watch for. So if you're using farm save seed from irrigation back to irrigation, I think there is some potential risk to you doing that. So just be aware uh, that this could be a problem. Um, there's a lot of unknowns about this problem and, and it, you know, bacterial blight can be environmental uh, can be in the area it can be seed borne soil borne uh, so there we're still learning a lot about this um, but uh, we don't even know if some varieties are better than others because you can have it show up in a variety but that is in the past there was no seed borne test so you didn't even know what your your seed stock had so it, it, you really couldn't make that variety accusation really because you didn't know what you were starting with so so just something to watch for in in cereal crops but especially durham's and that test doesn't it's just a yes or a no it's not zero so it's it's not foolproof either uh solid stem options um strongholds um uh, adamant kind of the main two on the durham and hard red spring from us um yeah, midge or, or a soft fly is a challenge in these days. Um, but rotation can play a big part of it. If you are cereal on cereal, you are definitely at more risk for having a, a soft fly problem. If you've got a, you know, a wider rotation, uh, you're, you're going to be better off. So nearing the end here, um, clean seed that's ready to ship right now. We've got quite a bit of clean seed on hand, ready to roll. Um, that, that can be shipped, treated, waiting on, on tests on a couple things here, but every, pretty much everything on this list is good to go. And um, uh, cleaning flax right now, brown flax. And then last slide here, uh, we can do FCC crop input financing. So uh, we just need to know ahead of time so we can line it up. If you are a sole proprietor, it's fairly simple. If you're a, a corporation, I think you might have to do uh, some uh, one additional paperwork or something. So a little more, a little bit hair more work with uh, if you're a corporation. And if you don't get our emails, you can get our, our mailing list, stampseeds.com, bottom of the page, you can click to sign up to our emails. And then events, we're gonna do an event at Ag Expo on the Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, details to be announced because I don't have it organized yet. Um, and then late June, winter crops tour, We'll be having that again. Uh, those are always a great tour. Uh, the first one of the season, typically for a lot of people. 
And then late July, I think we're going to push our tour on the later side past egg in motion, past all those shows so that people are kind of freed up and sometimes harvesting in our area, often harvesting in our area, but, but uh, we're going to aim for that late July summer crop tour. So that's all I've got for today. Um, does anyone have any questions or something you want me to go back over at this point? Blair, did I miss anything that you want to chime in on or? No, I think you hit everything. Okay, well, if if no one else has uh, other questions, was there any questions in the chat, Blair, or can you see that? There, there wasn't at this time, no. Okay, okay. Well, if no one has anything else, uh, this will be posted to YouTube so you can share with your friends. I'm going to get it posted hopefully later today. And, um, and uh, yeah, for more information, contact one of us and uh, go to stampseeds.com for any information you may be looking for. So with that, I think I'll uh, stop the recording and uh, stop the sharing. So uh, thanks very much for joining us for the meeting and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you.